Father, I thank you so much for just for blessing us today. Uh, just being here in your house is an amazing opportunity for us. It's an amazing blessing when we can gather in your name and just lift you up, praise you uh, in this dark world we live in, Lord. You're our light. And I thank you so much that we have that guiding light to refocus our lives where we can see the good, see the positive, see the love. Lord, see the aloha. So we are so blessed to have you in our lives and even more blessed to be able to come here and worship you. Lord, this day is yours. We give it to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and release our teens at this time with Caleb. You know the announcements today, the Senior Saints Bible Study. How old is a senior for this class? 50-ish. So we're going to have probably some 20-year-olds and maybe even 13-year-olds showing up and saying that they identify as 50-ish because the church is paying for some meals on that last Thursday. I saw some people when you, when you announced that, some younger ones, looking around going, yeah. They're going to identify. We, it's okay to identify, all right? You can identify with your age. My wife is identifying as uh, 25 again. <laughs> Next Friday is her birthday. So as she identifies as 25, we're going to go celebrate it like it's her 50th. <laughs> did I let the cat out of the bag? Did I? <laughs> oh, it's a glorious day, isn't it? It's a lovely day. Got Larry and Susan Riddle back there. Longtime members that moved last year. They came all the way back here and decided to visit us today. So thank you for your presence and being with us today. Do you ever wake up and look around and say, oh, man, are you really in control, God? You ever do that? I do that not just when I wake up, but I do that all the time, all the time. I want to talk about control today, and I want to share that God is in control even when we feel like he's not, even when we feel like he isn't. And I'm going to talk to you about the book of Jonah. Everybody remember the story of Jonah, right? Isn't this a neat little picture? You got that well or fish, whatever you want to identify that as, but it's, it's a, a shadow there. I love this picture. When I found it, I was like, oh, I've got to, I've got to use this thing. I've got to use this thing. And how many of you did not even notice that until I pointed it out? Oh, look at that. Look at that. No, it's there. It's there. Yeah. What, what uh, shark shape is that, Domi? Is that a shark? What is it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get serious. Let's come. Let's reel it back. Book of Jonah. I'm going to read to you uh, Jonah 1, verses 1 through 17. So, and feel free to follow along on the Bible app or in the YouVersion Bible app or, of course, in your bulletins or with your, your book, however you, however you can, just follow along with us. But here we go. Jonah 1, verses 1 through 17. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, you sleep? Arise, go out to your God, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us, 
on whose account this evil has come upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Let me stop right there. Wow. Pick me up, throw me into the sea. Isn't that amazing? Are you getting this point so far? Okay. Let me find my spot here again. Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it has become of me, because of me, that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you. O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Amen. Wonderful story, right? Many of you probably are reminded of this story of, of possibly years past when you were younger in Sunday school or what have you, but there's much we can gain from this story here that I want to dig into. Do you ever get tired of being asked about a, a certain matter, a certain story or a certain occurrence within your life? Yeah? You know, I, I wonder if Jonah ever got tired of being asked about this, what happened to him. I'm sure if I knew Jonah during this time, I guarantee you I would be asking him about this, about being swallowed by a fish. This is very intriguing. You know, I know I often get tired of people asking me certain questions. One is Iraq. Well, what was war like? What was Iraq like? Hey, it wasn't fun. Okay, it's something I don't want to revisit and I don't want to talk about. And I'm sure I look at Jonah and possibly he was much like this as well. It wasn't fun. I, I really don't want to talk about being in the belly of this fish for three days, three nights. It just wasn't fun. But what I do tell people, and I'm sure what Jonah probably would tell people, is that it wasn't fun, but God did in fact see me through it and get me safely to this point where I am now, right now. And that's the wonderful thing. That's the, the kicker right there. I believe that if you were to ask him about this, he'd probably say the same thing. Forget the fish, forget, forget that fish, forget being in the belly, forget this whole thing. Look at the God of the fish, amen? Look at that. Men have been looking so hard at the great fish that they have failed to see the great God. And that's where I want us to focus upon. Look at verse 17. We read, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The emphasis here is not on the great fish, but on the Lord. He is the focus. He is the dominant theme of this verse. The purpose of verse 17 is the magnification of the Lord. That's the purpose of it. Not the great fish of, of life, not the problem of life, not the, the thing that's holding us back or that's, that's keeping fear in our hearts, but of God. We see the Lord magnified in several ways, ways that help us to see God in our lives. First of all, here's the first point for you, is that God's control leads us to God's purposes, right? To God's purposes. We read that God provided this great fish, now, I believe that when it speaks of God providing this great fish, it's speaking more than just God creating a fish. The word provide means to assign, to a point, okay? To a point. That the great fish here, this great fish was simply carrying out God's purpose. So he was using the fish to carry out his purpose for what he had in mind, for what he wanted. The fish had an assignment, it was given an assignment by God, and it was carrying out this assignment to its fullest. The situations in our lives 
are not by chance, not by luck, guys. There are divine appointments. Don't kid yourself. There are so many things I look at in my life that I've done, or even just in a regular day, just break it down, just a regular day. You see how things pass and go. Sometimes we seem to forget that God is in control of all things, and we don't really think twice about it. Why, Stacy and I had a movie night, a, a date night at Bitten Theater. That's our house, because that's, that's the Bitten Theater. Some of you are like, oh, there's a theater on Kauai? Yeah, but uh, it's just for us. So, <laughs> But we watched a movie. What was it? Mother's Instinct? Is that what it was called? Anybody see this movie? Yeah. I'm not showing you a clip, so I'm going to talk about this for a moment. But it was about these mother, and the, this mother had an eight-year-old boy that died. Very sad. We watched the movie. It was, a, it was a pretty decent movie. But at the end of the movie, we sat there, and we, we looked at each other. And we said, you know how blessed we are having eight children, that none of them died, that they all lived to adulthood. You don't think much about that. I, I think you do when occurrences happen, like if one of your children are in a wreck or if one of your children are sick or something really happens, you sit there and you, you really start praying and thinking about that. But when nothing really occurs and you see them reach adulthood, you don't think too much about, wow, God really blessed us. You see, God is in control and he is using things around you and he is orchestrating everything before you and sometimes we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. God has created all things, and he, he's also, he also controls all things. We've already seen in Jonah chapter 1 that the Lord is in control of the wind and the sea. In verse 4, we read, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. The wind was under his control, and God is in control of your life. You're not here by mistake, friends. You're not even sitting where you are sitting right now by mistake. Everything is for a reason. God is in control. Fear not, you are not in control. And trust me, if you want to be in control, you don't want to be in control. Okay? Trust God and allow him to do magnificent things that he's working. I think of that scene on the Sea of Galilee where the disciples found themselves in this terrible storm. And Jesus spoke the word, right, in the raging sea to calm. We, we read this in Mark 4, 41, and, and we read, and they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Right? The word obey, let's look at that. The word obey simply means that the wind and the sea were subordinate to the will and to the word of the Lord Jesus. Jonah. Jonah's great fish here is an example of how he controls all things according to his purpose. He is and was and always will be in complete control whether you like it or not. Sometimes we will battle that, won't we? We'll go through life and we don't want to believe that God is in control because we're upset with him because our lives maybe stink for the moment. Maybe we find ourselves in a, in a deep valley. Maybe, maybe things aren't working out our way, Right? And we sit there and we get upset at God. And we say, God, why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you this? Why aren't he is. He is in control. If you have error in your lungs, if your heart is beating, if you are able to eat and drink and walk, God is in control. You see, God very easily, if he wasn't in control, maybe you wouldn't be alive. The world would look much differently if God wasn't in control. As bad as things may seem on the, on the surface, as rough and as horrible as we see life, could you imagine if God wasn't in control? That's a fear and a thought that I don't want to think of. I simply want to bask in the glory and knowing that God is in fact in control, amen? He's in control of all things. Always has been, always will be. It was not a case that a great fish just happened to be swimming by as Jonah was being thrown overboard. Now, you don't hear Jonah saying, man, was I lucky. Absolutely not. God had the fish at the right place at the right time. God had been controlling every moment of this great fish as he had a purpose for him. Do you feel as if possibly you've been swallowed by a great fish? A fish of the world. 
something that's tied you down, that you feel like you're trapped in the belly of just horrible things. Possibly it's sin that you can't get out of. Possibly it's just an occurrence or just your lot in life right now or whatever it is, you feel as if you've been swallowed up by a great fish this morning. And if so, fear not, God is in control because I do believe he has a plan for you just as he had a plan for Jonah as well. You know, I'm reminded of a story and I have no idea if this story is true or not, but it's a neat story and it fits really well for my sermon, so I'm going to use it. A, A story of back in Iraq, Uh, I remember hearing a story about a horrible, horrible storm where 50,000 American troops were caught out in the Iraqi desert in a three-day sandstorm. Three-day sandstorm. Anybody serve any time or seen desert sandstorms? Any of you? Horrible stuff, right? It's crazy. You can't see anything. You cannot see anything. They were caught out there. A three-day sandstorm, and the Muslim media during this time said it was the worst sandstorm in 100 years. So many Muslims proclaimed that the storm was sent by Allah to bog down the American troops to prevent them from getting to Baghdad, okay? So after the weather cleared, the army unit that was bogged down looked out, and in plain, perfect sight, they could see this open field, and they could see scores of anti-tank mines all over the place that had been revealed from the sandstorm moving the sand out, right? They wouldn't, that wouldn't have happened had the storm not come through, but what it did was it saved the lives of hundreds, thousands of soldiers, American soldiers, that would have perished easily. I don't know if this story is true or not, but it sure is a good story, yeah? God is in control of your life. He's in control of mine. He is aware of the landmines that are set before us. We serve a God that is in control of all things, even the sandstorms of life. He is in control of those as well. When bad things happen and we are hit with affliction and horrible occurrences in life, it's difficult to say, thank you, Jesus, right? It's hard to say that, and I I get that because, hey, I'm a human being just like you. Bad things happen, I don't want to praise him. But perhaps those bad things are happening for a reason, Perhaps he's using these bad things to bless you to clear the landmines out of your life. And maybe you don't even know they're there. But there's a reason, and he has a purpose, and he's working. We've got to have faith in this, guys. It is this great truth that allows us to say with the utmost confidence and assurance that God is, in fact, in control of all events, all happenings of our lives. He either allows or appoints Whatever happens in our lives, we let him or not. It's happening. He's in control. The second point is this, guys. I also want to share with you this, is that God, his control is not limiting. It's not limiting. Sometimes we like to limit his control, though, don't we? I believe Jonah was in the belly of this fish for three days. I believe he was there for three nights. I believe this. I have seen others whose lives were being held captive to drugs and alcohol. They were trapped or swallowed by the things of this world. I've seen horrible things in this world that would shock many, but I look at this, and it's easy for me to believe that this was, in fact, true because I see some things that just brings me to my knees. You, too, have seen things that perhaps is very hard to swallow or to accept. You know, people ask me, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish? Yeah, I do. You know, I, I, I say it was, it's much easier to believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish rather than believing that a 12-year-old could murder his grandparents or that a student could gun down his classmates at a high school or that you could fly planes into a tower and kill so many people. It's easier for me to believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish than to believe that all this other craziness in this world is happening. Sin, without any restraint, can take any one of us to a place never thought possible. Even now, some of us still carry the guilt, possibly the shame of things that we've done in our past, and we sit there and we ask ourselves, how in the world could I have done that? How could I have allowed my soul to go through that and make that choice and to do what I did? Perhaps it's something big or perhaps it's something small and you question yourself, how could I have allowed myself to do that? 
Why, just this last week, doing the flag waving, I had done something that I felt horrible about. I prayed, I gathered everybody together. I said, guys, no matter what, you're, you're probably gonna, we might get flipped off, okay? But just pretend they're doing this and just do it back. People are gonna say things, just zip it, don't say nothing. This is a peaceful thing we're doing. We're just sharing a little bit of Jesus, amen? So we go through, it was great, and yeah, we got some, some of the middle finger, and we got some of this, and you know, not too bad, not too bad. And we gather up, and we start praying, and we're talking, and a car drives by and yells, um, yeah, <laughs> yells, uh, free Palestine, is what they yelled. And your pastor, the one that said, don't be saying nothing, all of a sudden said something. I yelled back at him. Stacy hits me, boom. Yeah, I think she cracked a rib. We went to the emergency room that night. No joke. She hit me pretty hard, though. We didn't go to the emergency room. It did hurt, though, babe. It did hurt. And, and, and I said that, and I was so ashamed. I said, I didn't know that Palestine were slaves. Yeah, it's not, but I shouldn't. It, you know, you create confrontation and friction, right? And, and, and dummy me. I, I like to be right, don't I, Stacy? I like to be right, and that's what it was about. Sometimes we do things, big things, little things, whatever, and we sit there and we question, why do we do these things? Why do this? We've got to believe that God's here to rescue us. We've got to believe that God is in control no matter what's going on. I, I look at Jonah, and his world became really dark when that fish closed its mouth. I'm sure of it. Can you imagine how dark things could have gotten for him? God was still in control of his life, and he is still in control of our lives today, everything we do. He's here to rescue us, to help us. Somebody today, I believe, needs to be spit out of the darkness, filled with the life that you're living, that God wants to give you. God doesn't want you to stay in the belly of that fish for, for this time. He doesn't want you to stay there. He wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He's got a reason for why you're going through what you're going through, but he wants to get you out of that as well. He wants to show you the other side. God can bless you, and he will bless you. If he can do it with Jonah, he's going to do it with you. I, I believe that, and you've got to believe that too. The account of him being a, swallowed up by this great fish and then surviving three days after being in its belly doesn't really trouble me too much. Instead, what this does is it magnifies the greatness of God. It really focuses that picture for me, the greatness of God and his ability in what he can do. The story doesn't disturb me. It delights me. It doesn't bother me. It blesses me. It, it doesn't shake my faith. It stirs my faith. It tells us that we serve a great God and that he's in control. That's what it says to us. So when I read of God providing a great fish, in which Jonah could be swallowed by, in which Jonah could survive through that process, it tells us something here. It tells us that there isn't a person that God cannot save. There isn't a problem that God cannot solve. There's no prayer that God cannot answer. It tells us to magnify his greatness. And if that can't stir your very soul and get you excited, then once again, check your pulse, friends. Get excited and know that we serve a mighty and powerful God that can and will deliver you from everything you're going through. But you must open up your hearts to him. You must open up your hearts and be able to receive all that he has for you rather than simply saying, well, I'll receive on Sunday morning when I go to church. I'll, I'll, I'll read my Bible on Sunday. Well, I won't read it. I'll just have pastor read the scriptures. I'll sit there and listen. If you want more, you've got to dig for more, right? You know, how do you find gold? You don't just all of a sudden dig one hole and there it is. You've got to keep on digging until you find it, right? Ask any coal miner that digs for coal. Same thing. You just don't dig a little hole or a little tunnel and you find coal. There it is. You've got to keep on going. Keep on going until you find it. Guys, Serving Jesus, receiving the blessings, and getting out of the muckiness of life is the same way. You've got to keep on digging in Scripture, in prayer, in faith, and see things pass and come to pass. Here's the last point, and then I'm going to let you guys go for the day here. Is that God's control brings us to God's plan. Brings us to his plan. 
There's an interesting story. I think, I think John Heller will like this. Some of you that golf, maybe Julian, you'll like this as well. It's about a golfer that I heard this story. It's pretty good. About how electricity can really be dangerous. <laughs> right? It can be dangerous. Lee Trevino. You guys ever hear of Lee Trevino? Okay, so the golfers know the story, right? Lee Trevino was sitting under a tree during a tournament several years ago. He said, it bolted my arms and legs out stiff and jerked me off the ground. He got hit by lightning, guys. He went on to explain that, there was a, that, that he was sure that lightning was going to kill him. And for a moment, Lee Trevino would be the first to tell you that the, contra- the contact of electricity could be deadly. However, if you were to ask anyone that has been needing a shock to the heart, they would tell you that they needed that shock to the heart to keep them alive, that it was life-saving, right? Doctors make sense of this device called a defibrillator that keeps you alive. There's also paddles that keep you alive, that send a heavy shock of electricity into the body to restart you, to keep you going. It's important to keep this in mind when we look at our circumstances of life. Some circumstances that we think are deadly may very well be the case because God wants us to wake up. He wants to wake us up. He wants to rescue us. And that's exactly what happened to Jonah here. That's exactly what happened to him. Normally, being in the belly of a great fish would be a deadly circumstance. That would kill you. You'd be done. That's it. End of story. But in his case, in Jonah's case, it was a wake-up call. Much like the paddles or a defibrillator, it was a wake-up call to keep you going. The Lord prepared this fish to swallow him. Not primarily to stop him, but it was to wake him up. To wake him up. It was an instrument used in God's hand, not really to punish Jonah, but to get him in the right direction. Sometimes we go through stuff and we feel like we're being punished, we're being shunned, we're being excommunicated, whatever you feel like it is. That's not the case. God is simply trying to redirect your life, trying to show you what's important in life, trying to put you on the right path. It's much like a train that's been knocked off the, 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 the tracks. It cannot go. It's got to be back on the tracks. And, and, and Scott will tell you, if a train comes off its tracks, they're heavy suckers. It takes a lot of work to get them back on the tracks. It doesn't happen in five, ten minutes. Sometimes it happens for days, trying to pry and push and pull and lift and get those trains back, those cars back on the tracks where they can go. Friends, are you off track? Are you feeling the pains of being off track? Do you need to be shocked? Do you need to be moved? Do you need a wake-up call? Jonah did not get what he deserved. God in his grace provided this fish to save Jonah from sure death. And thank God for his grace. Thank God We don't always get what we deserve. God shows up. His grace comes with him. If we're all honest, we'd have to say or have to admit that we really don't deserve anything we get. We should have been thrown out of the ship ourselves, possibly. But God lovingly, patiently, mercifully showed us grace. Instead of washing his hands with us, he's never quit on us. He's never quit on us. He's still loving us. He still has a plan for us. God's plan for each and every one of us is a mighty, powerful plan. And we may not know what that plan is, guys. I understand. Maybe you're still searching, and you're not sure what that is, and you're listening to the sermon today, and you're saying, yeah, pastor, I get it, but where's the application to this? Yeah, I'm going through some tough times, but that still doesn't help me. It's still tough. That's where endurance comes into play, you see. That's where that faith comes into play. And and I want to encourage you to not give up, to keep on going, to keep on pushing, to keep on searching, seeking, praying, and loving. And as you continue going, greater things will happen. You see, if you want to be a loser in life, if you want to give up in life, if you want things to stay the way they are, then simply give up. Don't push forward, right? The minute you roll over, you get pinned, right? The The minute you stop, that's when things stop and cease to exist, but you have a fighting chance if you keep on pushing forward. And last I checked, if you've got God in your corner, you cannot lose. You cannot lose. He doesn't say that I'll make things better for you right now in five minutes immediately. He never says that. 
but have faith in knowing that he can and he will make things better for you if you just simply keep on going and learning to love him more. We need to learn to trust God because he is in control. And he's ultimately going to get us to our destination. He's ultimately going to get us where we need to be in life. And sometimes we feel trapped, guys, by our circumstances in life. See this little guy right here? Do you see that guy? The little boy? That's Robert, his father. That's Giovanni. Giovanni was in a wheelchair, right, Rodney? How long ago? Maybe a month? Maybe. He was, he was in a wheelchair. He was in a wheelchair. He's walking. He's walking. Hey, if a little kid can keep on pressing forward and have that desire to stand up and walk one day, what more can we do? What more can we do? If you sit back and say, I'm stuck in this wheelchair, I'm never going to move forward. I'm done in life. God says he's in control, but I don't believe it. It's not going to happen for you. Giovanni's walking today. His father loves Jesus. Giovanni loves Jesus. They come to prayer every week. They're really involved. They give all glory to God. Sure, he's got some struggles and some, some, some uh, physical ailments, but he's walking. They give all praise to Jesus Christ. If a little boy, I think he's what, first grade maybe? Is he even first grade? First grade. If a little boy can walk after being stuck in a wheelchair because of the faith of God, knowing that God's in control, what can he do for you? What can he do for us? I believe great things are in store for each and every one of us. I'm excited, not just for uh, life. I'm excited for our church. I'm excited for what we're doing in life. You know, in our bulletins, we're, we're looking at bringing in some new elders. We just did a membership meeting. We've got people joining the church. We've got new elders coming on board. We're going to do a, some baptisms and a picnic at Lydgate. Things are looking great. We are seeing growth numerically, but more importantly, we are seeing growth spiritually. And I'm excited because I'm seeing that spiritual growth within my church family. And it's great. It's amazing. I'm seeing some wonderful things. I'm so excited to see what God is doing in our lives and how we're going to be able to lean upon one another as we're faced with trials and tribulations and being swallowed up by the things of this world. God is using each of us to lean upon one another, to get through these difficulties, to see brighter days, and to see the light. And we can do it together. We can do it together as we continue to keep faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we continue pressing forward and looking up, not down, not accepting our lot in life, but knowing greater things are coming. It's all because of Jesus Christ. All because of Jesus Christ.